Um, at the end of my talk, I'll be asking you to take away a task or an action, and hopefully together we can do something about cancer. Cancer, it's, it's a scary word, isn't it? It's uh, one of those words you don't like hearing out loud. I remember when I was younger in my family, there was whispered conversations going on about, she's got the big C. Doctor says she hasn't got long. Okay? Such a shame she's so young. Well, unfortunately, let's talk about it now. I'd like to have some audience participation. What I'd like to do is, everyone who's had cancer, or has a member of their family who's had cancer, to stand up now. And those of you who are sitting down, if you know a friend or a colleague who's had cancer, please stand up now. Please look around. Please sit down. Cancer affects us all. We've all lost friends, family, colleagues to a disease which affects the young, the old, the rich, and the poor. And it's getting worse. About 50 years ago, one in four people developed cancer approximately. Today, it's about one in three. And in some parts of the world, it's about one in two. And this is a bit worrying. It's getting worse. And that means about 8 million people in 2012 will die from this disease. And the current projection suggests that it will grow to over 12 million by 2030. Now, that means 225 million people will die in the next 18 years, a phenomenal number. Now, I'm talking about cancer in the singularity, but you may not know this, but there's over 120 different cancers. And for some cancers, like lung cancer and breast cancer, there's actually some subtypes, which make it even more complicated. And the com most common ones are breast, lung, colorectal, stomach, and prostate. And the survival rates for each of these cancers vary enormously. A woman diagnosed with breast cancer has an 80% chance of still being alive after five years. But if you have one of these, lung, liver, or pancreas, then your chances of survival, like living for another five years, are really low. That's despite all the incredible advances in science that we've seen in the last 25 years. Now, on top of the incredible sad loss of life and the loss to many families, the devastation that causes, there's also the financial implications of cancer, the economic consequences of cancer. Cancer costs this world $895 billion every year. And if you look on the, this next slide, you'll see it's up in the left-hand corner as you look, $895 billion, and it's not in the press, it's not in the media. No one talks about this. But they do talk about that blue slide up there, which is the government uh, of Greece, which is $455 billion. Now, why am I drawn to that sort of chart, the financials? It's because I'm a numbers man. And as you just heard, I, until September 2010, I was a banker. Now, I know I shouldn't really admit that. And I know a lot of you are thinking, oh, my God. But nonetheless, I'm quite proud of what happened over those 23 years that I was in, a banker. And to be absolutely clear, I'm not a scientist and I'm not a doctor. But I care passionately <coughs> about the issue of cancer because it's affected my life. And although, you know, I, before I got into the cancer community, I didn't really know too much about cancer. I didn't have a really limited understanding. But I would say that the one thing about me is I feared it. And despite being well-educated, well-read, and also, you know, get, being wise to the world that, it was, that we have, I still didn't understand anything about cancer. In fact, I had misconceptions. And let me talk about three of those misconceptions that I had before I joined the cancer community B, C, C. First misconception is I thought it was just fate that you would get cancer, just bad luck. The other misconception before I joined the cancer community was that you can't catch cancer. And the third one was that it really was a plague of the developed, aging, wealthy part of the world. Well, let me cover each one of those misconceptions and pre present some facts to you. Let's talk about this one about fate. It's just unlucky if you get cancer. We've got enough evidence now from the last 50 years to say that up to 40% of all cancers can be prevented. And three big causes of cancer are tobacco, diet and obesity, and infections. And let me talk about each one of those. 
tobacco. Tobacco, each cigarette contains over 4,000 chemicals, and a large number of those are carcinogenic. Nicotine is as addictive as heroin. The average smoker lives 10 years younger, less than the average non-smoker. 50% of smokers will develop lung cancer. And as I showed earlier, the five-year survival rate of lung cancer is really low. The World Health Organization says that tobacco will kill one billion people in this century. One billion people. That's extraordinary. The sooner we rid this world of tobacco, the better. Now, what you drink and what you eat also affects your chances of developing cancer in your lifetime. Cancer has been linked with processed meats. It's been linked with low-fiber diets and alcohol. The diet of the Western world has changed dramatically in the last 30 years. We eat too much salt, sugar, trans fats, and processed foods. If we add that with also a lack of physical exercise, then what you're looking at is a Western world which is becoming more and more overweight and obese. Let me just show you what that means. This is America, the USA, and it's from 1985. And what this shows for every state, I colored in there, is the, the proportion of each state that are obese. And the code down the bottom left shows you that 10 to 14% was the maximum, really, in any state. The white states didn't have data at this time. If we go forward, we can see what's happened to America in the next five to 10 years. Okay? Now stop there for a moment. So at this point, you've got the first states in America where between 15 and 19% of the population of that state is deemed to be obese. 1991, carry on. Stop there. At this point, three states have got a population where more than 20% of that population are deemed to be obese. Carry on. Stop there. 25% in those four states are deemed to be obese. Carry on. Five, six, seven. And here we are at 2010. We have now got to a position where all of those states, more than 30% of the population, is obese. Now, the good thing about that, from my perspective, is if you can get there in 25 years, we can probably go back. So there's hope, okay? <laughs> now, obesity is linked with cancer, okay? There's a direct link between obesity and cancer. And a recent report from the UK suggests up to 7 to 8% of all women's cancers are linked to being overweight. Let me talk about infections. Can you catch cancer? Well, technically, no, you can't catch cancer. But the vast majority of cervical cancer cases are caused by a virus, the HPV virus. Now, I was not aware that you could catch a virus which would give you cancer before I joined the cancer community. And it strikes me that if you can catch it, then, of course, we can prevent it. And there's a vaccination that stops cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is not the only cancer which is linked to infections and viruses. Okay? Liver cancer is linked to the hepatitis B virus, and there's a vaccination for that as well. And two-thirds of all stomach cancers are linked to another infectious uh, bacterial infection, the same one that gives you ulcers. In Asia, 25% of all cancers are believed to be linked to viruses and infections. 25%. And they describe it over there that they are actually trying to address an infectious disease. Let me talk about the misconception I had about it's just really the wealthy, aging, healthy, um, developed countries. I said earlier that 8 million people will die of cancer in 2012. Two thirds of them will be in low and middle income countries. That's over 5 million. Now, when you think of developing countries, you tend to think of HIV, AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria as the biggest killers. But the truth is, as this chart shows, cancer kills more people around the world than HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria all put together. This is due to rapid urbanization, the adoption of healthy lifestyles, uh, Western diets, aging, too much smoking, a, a lack of health education, and other things. What we're watching in, in the developing countries is an epidemic in slow motion. And because the health infrastructure isn't there, 
what we're seeing is survival rates being very low, a growing burden and survival rates very low. In fact, cancer in developing countries could be seen as a, you know, a death sentence and often in great pain because pain relief is not freely available across lower middle income countries. So we have a big problem. Living environment, which is good, but it's actually encouraging cancer to flourish. Millions of people will die, growing burden, unless science comes up with some killer solutions. And also, we have the burden growing in the developing countries. Now, this all sounds big and pretty impossible to, put to address. But in my lifetime, our generation have achieved some amazing things. We've put a man on the moon, created the internet. We've eradicated smallpox and polio. We've unraveled DNA. We've created an iPhone. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> and in 2009, we saved the banks from disaster. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a period of unprecedented global achievement. So what can we do to change the future of cancer? Let me give you some hints. In the wealthy, developed nations, there are two things. One, let's address those lifestyles which are directly linked with the development of cancer. And secondly, let's invest in new technology, let's invest in new drugs, let's find them so we can make a difference to prevention, detection and treatment and stop the, the, the growth that we're seeing. A plea to all of us, a plea to all of you in developed countries, don't smoke, eat well, stay fit, control your weight, have regular checks and where appropriate, let's get vaccinated. I'd like to say a plea to all companies, all right? Put the health of your employees at the center of your corporate social responsibility agenda. Have great canteens. Now, give free health checks. Provide bicycle parking places outside your offices to encourage people to cycle. And for those companies that are involved in the, the production and sale of food and beverages, reduce the content of salt, sugar, trans fats. Move your products to more healthy lines. Okay? Be a bold leader against the fight against cancer. And let's make sure that we actually sell, produce, and market to children good quality products. Okay? They're our future. Let's act responsibly. In the developing world, the challenge is different. My plea to leaders is don't follow in the footsteps of the developed world. Don't let your country become unhealthy with poor diets, which lead to greater amount of cancer. And governments are critical all over the world. Okay? We, if your country wants to be competitive, then make sure your, your workforce is healthy. If, uh, evidence inform your policies. Address the tobacco industry. Encourage good industry practice and control bad industry practice. Invest in the health infrastructure. Put health education at the center of a child's early years of education. And build urban environments which encourage people to live good lifestyles. Now, I don't think this is impossible. It's not impossible. But it will demand partnership. Partnership from governments, the private sector, industry, and civil society, working innovatively, as we've heard today, to make a difference. Our generation has done so much. I used to think that cancer was scary. And I used to think it was fate. It was about me, my family, personal loss and tragedy. I now know that cancer is our generation's issue. It's about us working in partnership, governments, industry, you and I, to make a difference. We cannot let this happen. And I really believe that we can reverse the problem. Now, I said at the beginning that I was going to have a little task for you. Tomorrow morning, I'd like you all to email someone. For those of you who've got children, email the school and ask them what food they get every lunchtime. For those of you who run businesses, email your staff and tell them how you put health at the center of your business planning. And for those of your employees, email your boss and tell them they've got to do something about the health of their people. Thank you very much. <laughs>